chapter 10 now is a final interlude, and it's really interesting what Kohalath does here. We won't be as long in chapter 10 as we were in chapter 9, but it's just very interesting. The final two chapters of Kohalath's preaching notes are chapters you know, 11 and 12. Chapter 10 stands alone. It's unique. He, it's like he just stops. He leaves the theater of the absurd that we've just spent our time in chapter 9. And from there, now he steps into a place that we could just call the commons of common sense. Absurdity in chapter 9, common sense in chapter 10. You could hand someone chapter 10 and just say, here's some common sense things to to live by. And and most of them, all of them, yeah, yeah. They just make good sense. So let's read a few of these. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. (laughs) It's true. If I were to buy my wife some perfume she loves, there's a perfume called Amazing Grace. She really likes it. And I buy it for her, I package it up, and she opens it on her birthday, and there are a couple little flies just floating in there. Or let's not even be that gross. There's just a wing. How enticing would that lovely scent be? Then Kohala says, Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink, so a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. Or in the great words of that 20th century theologian Forrest Gump, stupid is as stupid does. What's interesting is is if a fool makes a smart comment, no one really notices. But if a presumably intelligent person makes a foolish comment, everybody knows. Oh, it's out there now. Did you hear what he said? What an idiot. And this happens all the time in politics. If someone slips up and just says something just kind of off the top of their head or off the cuff... Suddenly, they are a fool. And that's it. Suddenly, a dead fly is floating around in their ointment. And now, oh, okay, he's not so smart. Should have kept his mouth shut. Because Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered prudent. By the way, students, today is National Ask a Stupid Question Day. (laughs) It's today. So you're allowed for one day in our country. This was started sometime in the 80s. To just ask a dumb question. This was started by uh, teachers in the 80s who wanted kids to speak out in school. So they began National Ask a Stupid Question Day. Uh, I got a question. What is up with the fashion of the 80s? That's my question. I had a bright neon pink sweatshirt. I kid you not. Neon pink. You didn't even have to plug this thing in. You could go into a dark room and it just glowed. I was so proud of that. I played basketball. I was a drummer. I did everything I could to be masculine, a man's man as a high school and college kid. And I wore a pink sweatshirt in the 80s. It was very special to me. Anyway, Kohala's point. I digress. Kohala's point is pretty simple. It's the little lapses of judgment that can wreak havoc in our lives. That pink sweatshirt was a lapse of judgment. I fully accept, uh, admit that today. So was my mullet. But we're not going to go there, okay? <laughs> lapses of judgment. And all it takes is one, and there is a fly in the perfume. You could be riding along, perfect, everything going well, making all the right decisions, and you just make one foolish decision. How big was the sin that brought death into the world? Hey, Adam, you really need to try this piece of fruit I picked up at the market today. It's a big deal. Through the sin of one man, death entered the world. It was a bite of fruit. It was a fly in the ointment. It was a tiny little thing, but that lapse in judgment set history spinning. Also set in motion the entire plan of grace. Praise God for his work in that. We do stupid little fly in the ointment things all day long, little white lies. Catholics call them, what is it, venial sins? Is that right, venial? You know, they're not the the bad ones. They're not going to send you straight to hell, but, you know, they're little sins. Little lapses. Thank goodness my goodness doesn't get me into heaven. Thank goodness, it is only grace that saves me. I had a conversation with a young man this afternoon about this very thing. 
I know Jesus. I believe in Him. I'm not sure where I'm at eternally. Because I really like, he said, I, I, I've been going to church, you know, pretty consistently, not totally. I mean, sometimes I, you know, do the Sunday sleep in. But I really like hanging out with my friends, and I often drink a few more than I should. Where am I at with Jesus? And I said, well, you're going to hell. If it's on your merit. If it's your work. Have I told you this before? Here's the problem. The problem with us not being sure about our salvation is we're looking at ourselves. Okay? If we're looking at Jesus, we will always be sure of our salvation. Because Jesus is faithful. And he is unchanging. And he has paid the price. And he said, here's what you do to, do to work the works of God. You believe in me. So I'm going to look at him. And that's what I share with this young man today. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stop looking at yourself. Repent. And keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Yeah, but every time I repent, I know I'm going to do it again. Yeah, but repentance... Guys, remember this from the conference. Repentance is not saying, I'm never going to do this again. Repentance is saying, Father, I agree with you that this is wrong. And I'm turning it back over to you. But what if you do it again? Repent again. And what if I do it again after that? Repent again. Guess what? Repentance begins to win out over sin. Because more and more of the sin, just you just don't want to have to repent of it anymore. You keep giving it to God and giving it to God and giving it to God. And eventually, He's going to... He's going to get you to the point where you just, I just don't even want to do it. Repentance is not a one-shot deal. I'm kind of off track here, but know that. You don't come to Jesus, repent of your sins one time, and you're good to go. we got to repent all the time and keep repenting. Just turn to God and keep your eyes on Him, and your salvation is going to be secure in your heart, in your mind. You will know you're going to heaven if you're looking at Him. If you look at yourself, <laughs> you're in big trouble. If I look at myself, I'm going straight to hell. Because of those little lapses that I cannot control, they keep getting me. Flies in the ointment. Rick, we've only done one verse, and you said we were going to be faster than chapter 9. Okay, chapter, verse 2. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Amen. <laughs> sure. Amen. There, there were just so many, so many jokes I could have done with this one. I'm not doing any. It may be funny to make this political or even religious. You know, there's the liberal left in politics. There's the religious right in politics. Or there's the right in politics. And then there's the, the conservative right. And there's the religious right. And there's even the religious left in religion. There's liberality in religion. And there is conservatism or even to the point of legalism in religion as well. So... That's not what he's talking about here. When he says, and understand this, that a wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left, a couple of things that the, the right hand in the Middle East is symbolic of authority and strength and power and inheritance. Remember little Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my right hand, son of my strength. Son of my inheritance, son of my power, Jacob called Benjamin, son of my right hand. And so, a wise man's heart directs him toward the right. There's that picture of strength and inheritance there. The left hand in the Middle East. Even today, there are countries where if you offer the left hand to someone, it is offensive. Let's just say... It preceded toilet paper. Okay, can we just leave it at that? My apologies to all of you Southpaws out there. But left was a show of disrespect. Left was a show of the profane. Left was a show of, you know, the disreputable. And that's where the fool goes. Something else, though, that's even more simple than this. The wise man and the fool do not walk side by side. If you're going to the right and you're going to the left... Guess which direction they're going? Away from each other. You don't walk side by side with foolishness. If you are walking in wisdom, you are going one direction. If you're walking a fool, you're going the other direction. Wisdom and foolishness do not walk side by side. They aren't parallel. They are not mano y mano. It's not, hey, mi casa y su casa, you know? It's not, come along with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm wise, but I've got some foolish. You know, things that I walk alongside. No, you don't. Because if you're 
foolish, you're not wise. And if you're walking in foolishness, you're not walking in wisdom. You make a choice. You go one direction or the other. Even if the fool seems to be suddenly walking the right way, by the way, he's still a fool. Verse 3 says, even when he walks along, the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. Because foolishness and wisdom become our nature. If you're walking in Jesus Christ, wisdom should become characteristic of you. We should be more wise now than we were when we first believed. And increasing in Holy Spirit heavenly wisdom as we walk in that direction. As opposed to the foolishness. And note this, the longer a person walks without Christ, the more foolish they get. Which is why we have phrases like, foolish old man. That's someone who spent a lifetime walking away from wisdom. Even though he might think himself wise. Character is far deeper than a few short steps. Character is played out in the long haul. So what do we do with this? Again, chapter 10, common sense. Common sense. Embrace your direction. If you're a fool, man, be a fool. (laughs) If you're wise in Christ... Be wise in Christ and don't play the fool. Revelation 3.15, Jesus said, I know your deeds are neither hot nor you're cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, neither cold, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. He could just as easily have said, you're walking to the right and you're walking to the left and you're doing the splits. And you're not going to be able to do that for long. So pick a direction. And isn't it interesting the book of Revelation ends with, Revelation 22, 11, this verse, not the very end, but the last chapter, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Head to foolishness. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Man, go all out for Jesus. Or go all out for Satan, but don't try to walk side by side because it doesn't work. The wise man goes to the right and the fool to the left and they do not walk parallel. Verse 4. If a ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. This is good, a good word, especially at work. Keep your head. Keep cool. Don't let your boss's huff cost you your job. Don't let your your, uh, overseer's anger upset you so that finally you say, I've had enough, I quit, because you're halfway down the hall going, oh, I really needed that job. (laughs) Keep your cool. Because if you keep your cool, then it will help them cool down as well. And that's common sense. It's just good sense. 1 Peter 2.18 Peter said the same thing. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Do you work with someone who is unreasonable? Be cool. Be calm. Be composed. Common sense. It's a good word. Verse 5. There is an evil I have seen under the sun like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Verse 5. Verse 6. Folly is set in many exalted places, while rich men sit in humble places. I've seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. You know, there there are things we get wrapped around the axle about. Who got the promotion? Why is he on the starting team? I'm not. How come she got the break? Why are the slaves on the horses while we princes are down here walking? Things are upside down. They're they're topsy-turvy. Where's the justice? Here's the common sense. Here's what he's saying. It's common sense. Life's not fair. It's just not fair. And you're going to work hard at a job and someone's going to get the promotion over you. That's just kind of the way it happens sometimes. Sorry. But as soon as we recognize that life isn't fair, we're going to spend a lot less time whining about when it's not fair. Because, hey, it's life. She got the job and and I didn't. I'm sorry. Life's not fair. Probably my favorite line out of The Lion King. It's when the evil brother lion, I don't know if you've seen the movie. I mentioned Mufasa. Some of you laugh so you know. The brother lion just says, life's not fair. And I say that to my kids all the time. But dad, she got more than I got. Life's not fair. And they look at me like, you are so weird. (laughs) They got me pegged. 
Where's the justice? And by the way, the inequity that we see played out in verses 6 and verse 7 is caused by the stupidity of the ruler in verse 5. Note that. I saw this error that goes forth from the ruler, and then here's this mess. There's someone in charge who's putting the wrong people on the horses. There is someone in charge who is setting folly in exalted places while rich men, or the implication is righteous men, good men, men who know how to save the economy, people who have an idea about business, are not being called upon. Did I say I was going to avoid politics? (laughs) Sorry about that. But you know, I know it's it's too easy. It's like Oprah jokes. It's just too easy to, to do this. What do we do with that? What do we do with the ruler, be it a boss or, you know, a governor, a president? What do you do when you disagree? What do you do when you see things being done that you think are inequitable and upside down and wrong? It shouldn't be this way. Do you get upset? Or do you, like we talked about on Sunday, remember that your oath is to a higher king? King Jesus, man. He's my king. And so I'm going to keep his commands. I'm going to keep close to him. I'm going to, I'm not going to cross him. And I'm going to take comfort in him because he's my king. Let me ask you this. Next time you think something's not fair or you see things upside down the way it should be, it's not right. Was it fair or just or equitable that my king wore a crown made of thorns? Was that fair? Was it fair that a perfectly innocent man went to the cross. Was that fair? Life's not fair. But he did that. And he did it for me. Verse 8. A couple of real quick ones. Let me just jet through these. Verse 8. He who digs a pit may fall into it. That's common sense. Keep your eyes open when you're digging a pit. because It's there now. There's now a hole in the ground where once there was not one. <laughs> so in you might go. And a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. What? <laughs> Listen, common sense. Dig carefully and wear gloves. That's what he's saying. All right? Verse 9. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. What's he saying? Simple. Sticks and stones may break your bones. <laughs> Verse 10. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. What's that mean? Be sharp. <laughs> and by the way, if you're working all day with a dull axe and putting all kinds of effort and energy into it, the problem may not be a dull axe as much as a dull head. You know? Sharpen the thing. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success, he says. He says in verse 11, I love this one. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. (laughs) All right? You're setting up your business. I'm going to be a snake charmer. So I got myself a cobra, and they tell me he's trained, and I got my little horn. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna play for a minute. Let's take the lid off. I'm gonna get some over here. Snap! Oh, I'm dead. There goes my profit. Well, common sense. Make sure you start playing before you get the lid off and let the snake. You know, Rick, this is just kind of lame. What are we talking about here? Well, verse 11: snakes bite. That's the common sense. <laughs> snakes bite. Be sharp. Sticks and stones will break your bones. Dig carefully. Wear gloves. Common sense. I'm serious, gang. That's all he's saying. Why? Why, in the midst of this marvelous, wonderful, I'm speaking the language of the humanist, I'm getting down into the postmodern world, and now we're talking about sticks and stones? What's the point? It's all common sense. And then he says this, and, and don't miss this, in the last half of verse 10, wisdom has the advantage of giving success. Here's the deal. Having wisdom is absolutely useless if you don't use it. If you don't apply it. He's not saying wisdom will bring success. He's saying it has the advantage of bringing success. But if you want success, you have to take advantage of the wisdom. you got to apply the wisdom. Let me put it to you this way. 
Having a Bible is absolutely stupid if it's not applied. Why would you buy a Bible if you're not going to apply the Word of God? Why would you put it out there nice and, and, and keep it dusted on the coffee table? Ladies, why would you drop it in your purse on the way to church and not pull it out when you get here? Gentlemen, why do you not know where it is when you get to church? I thought I had it in the car. Well, that's where I left it after church two weeks ago. <laughs> Should be there. Should just be there. Having the Word of God is stupid unless it's applied. James said, prove yourselves doers of the Word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. How do they delude themselves? They think they got it. I got it. I'm sitting I got it. I'm downloading. I got it. If you're anything like me, you're not getting anything when you just sit there. That's why, that's why we're always talking about get your Bibles open, open up, take notes, pay attention, listen, read along, challenge me, go home, read it again, write down the verses, go through them. Apply, apply, apply. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Let me be more graphic than that. You look in the mirror, you see a huge booger hanging out of your nose, and you walk away and you forget that it's there, and you spend the whole day talking to people. I'm, that, this, is, this is the point, and, and, and I'm, I'm being gross on purpose. That's what he's saying. You look in the mirror, you see there's an issue there, you walk away and forget the issue. You see something on your face. <laughs> They're going to go, Pastor Rick, that booger tonight. Oh, no, it happened. Did it really? No, yeah. How many people has that not happened to? Raise, uh, show of hands. How many of you have never discovered something on your face at the end of the day that you know was there all day long, but you didn't know was there? <laughs> see, nobody is free of that one. I love what Bill Cosby says. He says, I look in the mirror in the morning, everything's okay. I look in the mirror at night, there's a hair growing out my nose like that. Where did it come from? How could that happen in five hours? Zoom, it's out. (laughs) And that is what it's like to read the Word of God and not apply it. You're looking, you see the issues in your life, you see the stuff God wants to deal with. But then you walk out the door and you forget all about it. Don't know what it was that we talked about. It's stupid. Once he's gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was, James says. The one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. And by the way, let me ask you this. How do you charm the serpent? Going back a few verses here. Serpent bites before being charmed. There's no profit for the charmer. Okay, so how do you charm the serpent? How do you avoid the bite of the serpent? What are you talking about? The old serpent. How do you charm away the wiles of Satan? How do you avoid the bite of the enemy? Simple. John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. That's how you do it. Belief about Jesus isn't enough. Hearing about Jesus is not enough. It's believing Jesus. It's believing Him. Trusting that He is who He said He is. He does what He says He's going to do. And He is in my life, active, involved. And by the way, this is His Word. Verse 12. Words from the mouth of of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. The fool just goes from stupid to evil. You know, we when we think of the word foolish, we tend to think of silliness. Not according to Scripture. Foolishness is not silliness. Foolishness is absolute danger because it is damnable eventually. Down the line, all those foolish choices are going to end up in the place of evil and wickedness. Verse 14, yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? The fool multiplies words. Have you ever seen cops? (laughs) When they're picking up the guy on the street, and he's trying to talk his way out of the drug bust? 
40 pounds of marijuana in his back seat. I was holding it for a friend, you know. And he just keeps talking and talking and talking. And you're sitting there watching. You, it's morbid. You, you want to change the channel, but you just can't. Because he's getting dumber and dumber with everything he says. And you're just going, shut up. Shut up. Stop talking, man. And he doesn't. And it's, yeah. So the fool multiplies words. But this phrase, no man knows what will happen and who can tell him what will come after him. You know, Koheleth has said that five times. This is the fifth time he said this or alluded to it. Ecclesiastes 3.22, if you want to jot these down. Chapter 5, verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 7, verse 14. And chapter 8, verse 7. And it's the same question he keeps rephrasing and repitting over and over. Who can know what's coming next? Who knows what's coming after him? Let me tell you who. We know. We know. We have every answer to what is coming after us. The Bible is full of those who have gone before so that we can see what comes after. And the Bible speaks of the one who has gone there and back again, Jesus Christ. And he reveals clearly and what and unquestionably what's coming after. It's called the book of Revelation. Read it. Know it. Live it. We can get on board with that. We can know what's coming after. Glorifying God. Or we can try for the underdog legacy that no one will remember anyway. I'm shooting for what's coming after. By the way, that's where you start turning toward glory and away from personal legacy. When you're not looking back, you're looking ahead. I'm longing for His appearing. I'm not caring what what I leave behind. I'm caring about who I take with me. And I'm looking forward. And that's the direction we're called. Verse 15, the toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. This is almost prophetic. And, man, I, Glenn, I, I, I hate to keep stepping on you with this Daniel study you're doing. But I keep seeing these Daniel examples right and left every time I open up. And here's yet another one. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad and whose prince is feast in the morning. Verse 16. Dude, that is talking about Belshazzar. Belshazzar? Belshazzar. Read the story in Daniel chapter 5. It's a great story. We've referenced it in here before. Belshazzar, the stupid young king whose dad, uh, what's his name? Nabonidus. Nabonidus is probably off somewhere fighting in wars and left his son in charge. So he's a puppet ruler for his papa who's off fighting. Belshazzar, hang on a second. I think the bat is back. Belshazzar has a huge party, big celebration. They're getting drunk. They're feasting. That's all they're doing. All night long, they call for the articles of the temple from Jerusalem to be brought in. The gold art. They're drinking out of those and just partying it up. And you know the story. You may recall, suddenly a hand appears and begins to write on the wall. And it writes, Mene Tekel Upharsin. What's that mean? Well... They call Daniel because no one else knows what it means. They bring him in there. Daniel reads and goes, oh, (laughs) yeah, I know what that means. Mine, numbered. Belshazzar, your days are numbered. Your kingdom is numbered. Tekel means weighed, which means you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And the third one, Ufarsin or Perez, both words fit, means divided. Your kingdom is divided. And that night, Belshazzar was dead. And that night, the Medes and the Persians flooded into Babylon and conquered the land. And it's an amazing story. This is what happens when this king who is a lad and his his, uh, princes feast in the morning. They're just parting it up. Why did this happen, by the way? Because Belshazzar was a fool. He was a fool. He didn't apply wisdom. He, he had access to the greatest wise man on the planet, Daniel. And he didn't ask for help from him or seek him until it was too late. And it's an example of the fool. Verse 18. Through indolence, which is slothfulness, the rafters sag. Common sense. 
Keep an eye on your house. It's not eternal. (laughs) Boy, do I know that. And through slackness, the house leaks. Or idleness. So slothfulness and idleness he's talking about there. Verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. What? Here's another one of those verses. If someone just happens upon the single verse, they could take that out, put it on a pen, and wear it, and go, Bible says so. (laughs) But here's the deal, gang. This is this verse is not how it should be. It's how it is. It's how it is in the world. Why do we go out to eat for enjoyment? It's fun. Like the fellowship, the food, let's do it. It's a good time. Wine makes life merry. And remember what... um, I know I'm almost done because I'm starting to forget stuff. Uh, Proverbs 30, uh, King Lemuel. Remember what Lemuel's mother said? Man, give strong drink to the guy who's perishing. You know? For death, for if you're dying, for medicinal purposes. That's that's what you want it for. But not in our culture. Wine makes life merry. You know what we heard at the conference? Norman Geisler. Some of you have heard of Norman Geisler. Uh, great guy. They were having a panel session, and he was talking about prohibition. And he said, he's all for bringing back prohibition. Now, I've always been one who said, boy, I don't know, because you can't legislate morality. You know what he said? During prohibition... Um, there was a whole list of things. You guys might help me remember. Of the state of the country, during Prohibition, uh, there were less deaths, yeah, less, domestic abuse. less domestic abuse than any other time. Psoriasis of the liver went way down. Psoriasis of liver went, yeah. All these things, all these horrible outcomes of drinking went <sighs> during Prohibition. And he said it took 75 years for our country to get back to levels that are pre-Prohibition, which is where we're at right now. But... Wine makes life merry. Drink up. That's the way it is. Not the way it should be, the way it is. And money is the answer to everything. And is that not what our world believes? Why are people so freaked out all over the world? The whole global economy is is a wreck. And by the way, I'm not an economist, but I don't get that. Why don't we all just start over? (laughs) Just, okay, clear the books. You know, just let grease be grease. And and just, just, let's just start over. But I don't have any economy training. So don't take that to heart. Money's the answer to everything. It's just kind of the way it is. Verse 20, finishing up. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king. And in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man. For a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. In other words, it could be tweeted. <laughs> Modern translation. (laughs) He's saying, man, don't be talking about people behind their back because it's going to float out the window. Someone's going to overhear. I mean, that's the picture. He's saying gossip is stupid because it's going to get around. Don't slander. It's going to get heard. And, you know, yeah, it was a pun, but it's so true today. People are just like, oh, dude, I got to tell my friends what I just saw. Oh, I got to tell you what. Man, I'll tell you what. Tweeting, Twitter is taking gossip to a whole new level. Which should scare us. It's it's totally, totally different now. Technology is making sin just go. <laughs> and um, bring it on the end faster, I think. So, okay, all this stuff. What is Koheleth doing in chapter 10? Some of these seem very random. We can make some spiritual application, but for the most part, it's just common sense. So why? Why? You've got to ask the question, why after this deep movement through humanism and talking about that and considering the language of the lost in chapter 9 and prior to that, why suddenly in chapter 10, before what we know is the conclusion in 11 and 12, why in chapter 10 does he just stop and do this common sense thing? And I'll tell you what I think. It's just my opinion. I think Kohaleth is getting the agnostic ready for the altar call. I, I think he's preparing the humanist for the homecoming. What do you mean? The religious spin in our world and Christianese and some of the language that, that we even can use with non-Christians can pretty quickly turn them off and, and turn them away. When we go for the throat too quickly and the world has a tainted view of Christianity because of religion. Not because of Christian religion so much, but just because of religion. People have this tainted view of religious things.
things, and they see Christianity, unfortunately, that way. So what? So God uses common sense. We have a chapter of common sense. And at the end of this chapter, Koheleth is going to start going into, all right, let's put this all together. Let's just, you know what? Let's come down for a minute. Let's just talk common sense. God says, Isaiah 118, come now. Let's reason together. I love this verse. Come now. Let's reason together. The Lord doesn't say, come before my throne. And You know, I mean, come now. Let's reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they'll be white like wool. Well, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to be clean? Who doesn't want to be free from guilt and disappointment? Who who doesn't want to have joy in their life? Who doesn't want to know for a fact that for the rest of eternity, they're they're saved? And they don't have to be frozen. (laughs) Who doesn't want this? What are you saying, Rick? I'm saying that's what we have to offer in Jesus' name. We don't have something weird to offer people. We have one of the most common sense things in the world. Love, joy, forgiveness, redemption, eternity, power, strength, comfort, peace. And I could go on and on. That's what we have. Who doesn't want that? Even the secular humanist? Yeah, the secular humanist is looking for love. Just in all the wrong places. (laughs) The secular humanist wants to be able to believe in something. Right now, evolution seems to be the going currency. The secular humanist wants to have hope that doesn't dissipate when the thing he was hoping for is over. It's common sense. Come now. Let us reason together. And my friends, that is what we have to offer the humanistic secular world in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Lord, thank You for the teaching. Thank You for giving us ears to hear. Lord, not only Your Spirit, but, wow, ears to hear the language of the lost. And I pray, Father, for the Bridge Fellowship that You would more keenly attune our ears to understand the language that is spoken outside the four walls of church. That we would just speak into people's lives with the common sense truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is good news. Truly as simple as that, Lord. Good news. Thank you. Lord, thank you for opening the good news to me when I was young. Thank you for taking me through the good news constantly again and again, drawing me back to that simple truth of your love for us. Wow. And help us not to overestimate how much knowledge we have to have or preparation. Help us just to be faithful, Lord. Doers of your word, in your word, listening to your spirit, available, and just faithfully walking out the truth that you've given us every day. And Lord, I do pray. And I'm going to invite our whole fellowship. I pray, Lord, you will give each one of us one soul this year. Just one. Use each of us to speak the common sense of the gospel to one lost person this year. I would, I'll love, love to see that, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.